The agenda this week explored what responsibility employers have for their workers' happiness, asked if the politics of inaction on climate change are shifting, and considered the state of children around the globe. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with a look at moving a growing population around the Greater Toronto Area. Last year, the population of the Greater Toronto Area was just shy of 7 million people. By the end of this decade that we have now entered, it's expected to reach 8.3 million people. And by the year 2046, projections have it at more than 10 million people. And remember, this is all on infrastructure that was essentially built for a population half the size or less. Phil, when you see those numbers, what do you think? I think we have to maintain the rate, the very aggressive rate of investment that we have now. In the past year, we've put $4 billion worth of new transit infrastructure into the ground and commissioned it. Um, this year, I'm aiming to have $4.5 billion of infrastructure in the ground. I've grown the GROW services, the GO services, by 35% in the last two years. That's 35% more capacity out there. We have the highest growth rate of passengers coming to our railway um, and, and to our bus, GO bus services. We must maintain this rate of growth. And yet, when you take the GO train from Union Station to points west or east at rush hour, you're still lucky if you get a seat. That's true, and that is why we have a massive GO expansion program um, that we're in market for now. And the GO service capability, we today move around 80 million people a year, mm. and we aim to take that to 200 million people in the, in the timeline that you've shown there at the beginning of the program. Wow. Marcy, what pops to mind when you see those numbers? Well, when I see those numbers, um, I, I, you know, Toronto, the Toronto region has always been growing at a fast rate, you know, comparatively around the North American market. Um, but I think what we're what we're what we're grappling with is the rate of growth is both accelerating, and it's also changing. The markets are changing, so people are moving to different places than they chose to move to 20 years ago. Um, you know, the way we built our sort of uh, um, radial pattern of commuter rail um, that serves the downtown, but we have dispersed patterns of uh, employment, and those areas are very difficult to service with the growth rate that we have. And the and to Phil's point, um, the the lack of infrastructure we've built to keep up with that growth over the past few, at least three decades. And let me put that to John. I guess I should wonder whether or not we, whether you think we are able to keep pace with the infrastructure that's going to be needed for all that, or whether you are much more hopeless about the possibilities of keeping up with that growth. I'm not hopeless about it, but I think that I think that it requires a, a greater sense of determination and an understanding of exactly what the implications are of that growth. And you know, to if you want to see it, you go to Union Station at rush hour, you go to Young and Eglinton at rush hour, or Young and Bloor at rush hour, and you see that our infrastructure is essentially a capacity, and that's just within the city of Toronto or these major sort of multi-nodal hubs. So, um, you know, it just needs to be stepped up and I think that the Metrolink's investment is great but uh, it has to be much more so to get to the you know to to meet the needs of that kind of population growth. Well Marcy Phil talked a moment ago about needing to get continued event. You and I both John are suffering from the uh, mm. <clears throat> the sore throat of the season we're going to try and get through this as best we can. If we talk about the kind of growth that's expected, we're talking about way more jobs, we're talking about way more cars, we're talking about the need for way more transit, right. we've got the need for way more housing, more school, right. I mean, just make a list, it's all there. That's right. What, do, do you think we have the capacity, talent, et cetera, money, investment, in order to serve all that? Well, I think we, we, we definitely uh, need to continue to build out what we've, what we've been planning. You know, our problem is that we haven't landed on a plan for some time and, you know, now we have one and we should, we need to build that out as, as quickly as possible. Um, but there's, there's another side of the transportation uh, coin and that's the land, land use aspect of it and really being more deliberate on where we're planning for growth. Um, you know, we've got, as I, I mentioned, the, you know, the market has changed in the last 20 years. People want to live in a more urbanized area. That's why you saw, you know, the growth rate of Toronto between 2017 and 2018 grow to 77,000 people. Hmm. We added in the city of Toronto alone. And that that's is amazing. a that's that, like that, plunking Sudbury in the middle of Toronto. That's right. It's a huge number because the jobs are here because we have a booming economy, mm -hmm. you know, and that is that's a, a big part of why Toronto's success story is that we have a booming economy. And, and the population uh, growth to match it as well. 
Emiliana, do you feel it's uh, reasonable or not for younger people today to expect a level of fulfillment uh, out of their jobs that, say, their parents or grandparents, it never would have occurred to them to demand that from their work? I think it's absolutely reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to the younger generations to affect change and to make progress. And some of our, you know, earlier, wiser generations were actually part of a of a, of a labor system that counted on replaceability of workers, that counted on a, a more extreme hierarchical organizational structure, which actually really um, expected people to settle for working conditions that perhaps were not as fair or equitable as they could be. Um, there were also big differences in opportunity that were a function of, of your gender or your ethnic um, or cultural background, and all of those things are changing. And the younger generation is bringing with that the expectation that you know, we ought to be able to flourish in our work, and our work and the time that we spend at work should be a source of our well-being, not something that detracts from our well-being. So I certainly welcome the progress and the change and the thinking that's going on in the younger generations around how can we together uh, figure out a way to make work something that, again, contributes to our sense of well-being, to our happiness in life. Well, Tara, let me make the question uh, even more challenging. I take it that you like your occupation because mm. it is stimulating, it, mm. it is creative, you have mm. to use your brain, it, it checks all those boxes off for you. My hunch is if you worked in a coal mine, if you worked in a textile factory, if you were on a car assembly line, uh, you would not be a very happy person. Mm. Where do you find the joy in those kinds of jobs? I mean, that's a great question. I do think, I'm so glad Emiliana had brought up the question of working conditions, because we can think about work on an individual level. We can think about work in terms of individual happiness and contentment, but I think we have to pull back and look at the larger structural issues at play here. One of which is, I mean, at, speaking of millennials, they're facing a workplace that is driven by precarious work. Mm -hmm. It's very unstable. Wages are stagnant. We know the cost of living is going up so much. So perhaps with prior generations where you could find a stable life at work in one of those jobs that you mentioned, you could be middle class, you could have a family life outside of your job and perhaps find some of your meaning there. Now, that is not necessarily an option anymore. You're scrambling with three different jobs and maybe mm -hmm. one from an app and trying mm -hmm. to make your rent in all these different ways. And so I think that breeds discontentment. Those structural conditions are not something that we will be able to address on an individual level. David, if you're an employer, though, mm -hmm. and you want to try to infuse those, let's just call them like repetitive jobs or whatever it mm -hmm. is. It's something, you're going to do this thing, you're going to do it a thousand times in the course of a day, assembling a car, whatever it is, sure. and it's, it, it, you know... It's it, mundane. It's mundane, it yeah. doesn't check off too many creative boxes. Mm -hmm. As an employer, how do you make that work more meaningful? I'll give you an example from my own experience. I mean, I have a, a subordinate who works for me who his, his job is to schedule 300 courses a year in my program. Now, that's a, a pretty, could be a pretty mundane job. But what I do is try to instill in him how important it is that he does his job well. Because doing that job well means that our students are having a great experience. They're getting the courses they need when they need them without mm -hmm. conflicts. And so it's important for as much as possible for these types of jobs to try and instill a sense of meaning uh, for to, to that people can grab onto and say, okay, this is why this job is important. And that gets them through, you know, having this mundane task that might be very, very uh, simple, uh, but, but very still very important. Now, in the 1970s, uh, two researchers, Hackman and Oldman, came out with something called the Job Characteristics Model. And I teach it to this day to my students. And it's a model of job enrichment to find ways to make jobs more interesting, find ways to allow students, allow employees to, to have uh, integrate a number of different skills, take responsibility for their work, get feedback, and have meaning into their work. And that is, that, those are the kinds of things that we can do that lead to more satisfaction, more happiness, and ultimately more perform greater performance. Asking for a raise and getting it. Doesn't that deal with a lot of these issues around happiness? If you get paid more, you're happier, period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, in an immediate and short-term sense, absolutely, it feels great to tie your sense of accomplishment to a direct and explicit reward like greater payment or, or some kind of bonus. 
However, over the long term, salary levels, bonuses, they really aren't as powerful at um, inspiring a sense of enduring meaning or purpose or motivation or ultimately happiness in the workplace. Um, there's a great study done by Dan Ariely where he either gave people money, a bonus, or he had the boss call them up on the phone and say thank you and really describe how their work benefited the company and the other people who the company was serving. And he looked at productivity, looked at how hard those people worked. And the day after, the one day after the bonus or the call, both groups' uh, performance went up. They both um, improved. But two days later, the people who got the monetary bonus, there was also a free pizza condition, their performance went back down to actually below the baseline. Mm. People who got thanked, their performance maintained and stayed high. So there's something really unique about that sense of meaning, the extent to which we're contributing to something beyond ourselves, the extent to which that's being recognized by the company and the leaders in the company. That really matters to our sustained happiness at work more than and just how much we're getting paid. Of course, if we're getting paid rock bottom wages, the whole equation shifts. And if people are miserable because they can't make ends meet, that's a different kind of challenge to happiness. We know the environmental price around climate change. Can we now state unambiguously that there is a political price to be played, paid for ignoring climate change? Yes, well, I think there are uh, a number of political prices. Uh, the first, first and foremost, we know that climate change um, affects disproportionately those who are poor, uh, both internationally and within, uh, within nations. And so um, there is a political price that these people have to pay. They're losing, um, they're losing jobs, they're losing homes, um, their uh, way of life is becoming more expensive. And so I think uh, absolutely that that political price is, is starting to ratchet up over time. And as it becomes more pronounced, we're going to see more and more sort of uh, demands for climate policy and more pushback against this kind of climate denialism that we've seen uh, uh, in Australia, for example, in the last, uh, over the last month. Peter, in your view, is there now a political price to be paid for lacking a coherent <clears throat> policy on climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think there is. I mean, there's, there's, there's two reasons why. One is that it's, it's increasingly an important issue for, for, for voters. Um, and the second is that there's not politically a consensus over how to deal with it, so it becomes a point of, a point of debate. And I think the last Canadian election was a great example of a case where, um, you know, the climate goes up as one of the most important issues. It's one of the first times, the first time I've ever seen it being a top one or two issue over and over again in voters' minds. And there was differences between the parties in terms of how much emphasis they were putting on it and how credible they were on those, on those issues. You get those two factors, importance and difference between parties, it's going to become a big, a big political issue. So in the Canadian case, I think that the, the numbers are pretty clear. We worked on some data from the Canadian election study that suggested, you know, for about 6% of voters, climate was really the pivotal issue for them. That may not sound like a lot. It doesn't. It doesn't sound like, but, but if you kind of work through the econometrics of it, if you do the analysis, it turns out something like 8% of constituencies probably would have had a different outcome if the environment had been a level issue between the, between the parties. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was an issue to the advantage of the Liberal Party. The Conservative Party paid the cost for that. Well, let me go to a very proud Conservative sitting at this table right now and ask, Mark, is there any question in your mind but that the Conservative Party lost the last election in significant part because too many Canadians didn't think they had a coherent position on climate change? No, I don't think that played into it at all, to be honest. I think, uh, and, and I don't think there is yet a political price to be paid for not having a coherent policy on climate change because I don't think there is a party in Canada that had a po coherent policy on climate change. The Liberals are smoke and rope with what they've put out there. Everybody, even their own people, say it won't work. The Conservatives absolutely had none, um, you know, and they didn't get any points for that. But I don't think they lost a lot of points for that. I think there were many other factors that cost them the election. The only parties that had a somewhat reasonably sort of acceptable to the to the green experts uh, policy on climate change were was probably the green party but that would have bankrupted canada you cited the abacus uh, data which is for the first time you know very highly uh, aware it suggests that canadians are about climate change 82 percent but the only issue that was higher than that you didn't have up there which is affordability and i think that's the rub is we have to find a way and politicians have to figure out a way so that those poor people who are most disadvantaged by you know climate change 
aren't also wiped out by the fix. And, and when you look at uh, economic uh, measures like carbon taxes, cap and trade, that inevitably raises prices. Well, that's great if you're going to save the planet 50 years from now or 20 years from now. But if that means I can't feed my kids next week because I can't afford the food they need or the transportation or my job to get to my job, that's a problem. And that's where I think political parties need to suck back. They all need to reload and come up with some kind of a solution that actually will make some difference that p people believe will make a difference but that also isn't going to you know cut off your arms so you can afford to buy gloves I have to tell you that's a very unconventional position you've just taken doesn't make you wrong but it's unconventional do you want to go at him on it no I don't want to go at him I actually I mean I think I, I agree I think there well I want to make a couple of points one I think it's important to say People are very concerned about climate change, but um, in Canada, only about half the people who are concerned about climate change think that it's caused by human activity, right? So this is a very important poli uh, political implication for what we do policy-wise, right? Is this just, you know, sunspots or natural variation, or is this something about our, our actual behavior? And so we have to keep that in mind when we think about these policy solutions. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with Mark. I mean, I, th I agree with Mark in the sense that uh, we cannot have solutions that disproportionately penalize uh, working class folks and poor folks who are already struggling with much more immediate problems. And, and I've actually gone on record saying that I don't think carbon pricing is a good idea because I think we're fighting over something that has basically a marginal effect and um, depending on how it's designed can also make life more expensive for people who can least afford it. Now it doesn't have to be that way, right? Mm -hmm. It can be designed in a much more progressive way in which basically it becomes more of a wealth tax, right? If you consume over a certain amount then you pay mm -hmm. a lot more, um, but it it, but that again, that all depends on the design. Your view is clearly the more conventional view in the country, which is that the lack of a coherent climate policy did adversely affect the Conservative Party at the ballot box. Mark Toohey is not convinced. You want to try to convince him? Well, I mean, actually, I want to agree with Mark on 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 one thing. I mean, the 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 total global coherency of environmental policy in Canada is yet to be yet to be established. Let's put it let's put it that way. I mean, so economists who are have one view on this tend to agree that that carbon taxes are a good way to address climate change because they think that putting a price on everything is a good way of dealing with it. I happen to agree with that, right? It turns out, though, that it's actually hard to find an economist who thinks that the current price on carbon is enough to have a big noticeable effect. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's a bit like saying, well, the evidence is that you have to have chemotherapy to deal with cancer, and let me give you a minuscule amount to deal with your, to deal with your cancer. Well, that's not actually, actually evidence based. Not going to get it done. So for, I think for this government, to be fair to them, it was a lot of political capital that had to be expended to get this price on carbon, to try to get a floor price across the country. It's a difficult thing to do politically. But one of the compromises they made was to bring it in at a low enough level that it wasn't really going to bite. We talked about the millions of kids right now who uh, originally from Syria are now finding themselves in neighboring countries, uh, obviously far away from home and in desperate circumstances. What do they do for school? Well, in some of the countries, they are, we're working, at, we at UNICEF are working with local ministries of education to try and increase the amount of uh, school capacity that's there. Turkey, for instance, has had to deal with this incredible influx. They've taken the most children. Um, and, and they have a question. Do you teach them in Turkish or mm -hmm. do you teach them in Arabic? Mm. Because are they going to stay or are they going to go back home? And that's whenever there's, there's a different language issue for refugees, that's a huge, huge uh, political issue. Because, and what's the answer to that question? Well, for instance, if you've come as far as Canada, you're going to teach people in English or French, right? Because that's what it is. The Turkish school system has decided to make space in Arabic because they're hoping for peace, because everybody you talk to... I, I, I've been in refugee camps talking with, with parents and children. They want to go home. Yeah. Yeah. They want to go home. Yeah. And you, you can say to them, but, you know, your home... I mean, I try not to say it in this way, but your home's being destroyed. And they know it. Yeah. But they still want to go home heart. and they want, it's their heart. Yeah. It's their heart yeah. and they want to go back in time. They'll want to go home and they want to rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. Lindsay, how much is right to play in a lot of these neighboring countries around Syria and what impact can they have there? Uh, right to Play Works um, has been responding to the Syrian crisis um, and also working with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, um, and Palestinian refugees in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and I think, you know, building on your points, David, one of the things that we've really seen and what's unique about the current crisis is that um, the length of displacement 
um, now is very different than what it was 20, 30 years ago. In the 90s, the average length of displacement was about nine years. Um, now it's 20. So that means that, you know, a, a child born today will spend their entire life in displacement. I was in Jordan and Lebanon earlier this year, and we met kids that they, they don't know Syria. That's that, you know, they, they have been, they are born in Jordan. They were born in, Le in Lebanon trying to make a life. Um, but we know that it's also incredibly challenging um, what they're facing in, in these host countries. We did a study a couple of years ago um, with the International Institute for Child Rights and Development that was looking at the effects of, you know, psychosocial effects and how play can support and one of the most uh, profoundly shocking pieces that I you know, learned from the study was that the children we engaged with actually found that their life in their host country, in this case, Lebanon, um, was more traumatic than their actual experience of seeing family members mm. killed mm. and fleeing Syria because of the social isolation, the lack of access to some fundamental rights around lack of education, healthcare, seeing their parents not have a right to work, a right to own property, and uh, not knowing when they can return. So that's where coming back I think, to, to your points earlier, Kim, around thinking about the type of psychosocial support that they need mm -hmm. so that these kids can be resilient. So that when we're talking about an entire generation potentially spent in displacement, when they do go home, which is our hope, that they are strong and resilient and capable of really transforming their community. What is the reality of life like for many uh, Indigenous children in this province? Well, I mean, it varies, of course, yeah. community to community, but some of our fly-in reserves, as an example, are faced with um, basic, lack of basic needs. So you're looking at food, clothing, water, housing, right? Uh, housing shortages. On top of that, you have um, uh, suicide epidemic that we saw unfold again over this last winter break of very young children. Um, How I, young? We, I think they were young as 11. Killing themselves? Yes. Right? And, and how, how is society, are we allowing this to happen without, without outrage? Um, and this is not, this is just the past few, past month. If we go back year after year after year, we can go back decades of a suicide epidemic. And then, then we have them um, picked up and brought into child welfare and very often brought, brought south. So think about coming from Hudson Bay and being placed in a residential program in uh, Peterborough. Mm. Right? Quite a culture shock. It's quite a culture shock. And are we prepared to welcome them? And when we talk about belonging, how do you have that core need? And I think it's a basic need we, uh, uh, to belong. How do you have that core need of belonging mm -hmm. when you don't have your family and kin around? Mm -hmm. And then what's most important for me is who's safeguarding that child? Who's, what, whose eyes are on that child to make sure they're safe down in Peterborough? Because I know that up on a, a reserve, you're going to have an auntie. You might have a storekeep. You might have a teacher. You might have a, a, a maintenance person who knows this young person, and they have a relationship, and they're watching out for them. When they're a stranger down south, that's what they feel. They feel, I don't belong. They experience racism and disconnect from their family. Let's put this in a context, that uh, a, a more historical context. People are now aware of the ravages of the residential school situation in the past history of this country. Mm -hmm. If you were to compare the number of kids in care today to the number of kids who suffered as a result of the residential school system, yeah. what's the comparison? Well, Cindy Blackstock tells us there's more kids in residential care today than there were at the height of the residential school system. That's shocking. It, it's, it's tragic. We have to turn the tide. Mm -hmm. And we keep, in different ways, doing the same thing over and over again. We need to help Indigenous communities uh, develop their own self-governance of children's services. And when that happens, we will stop, we will, we will change our legacy of removing kids into child welfare. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.